Hey there everyone, so it's been a while since I've done a video with video and not just audio, but I figured since I'm home for the break after my midterms, got my nice shelf behind me so you can see what's going on here. Today I'd like to continue looking at the Marquis de Sade's Justine. This is a really fascinating work for looking at the psychology of pleasure and seeing the limits to which we can take libertarianism and the notion of tolerance and libertinage and acceptance of divergence. And from where we picked up on last time, Therese has basically been through all these struggles. She's been in a gang. She's seen rape and murder and torture and whatnot. And now she's basically gone through various people. And now she has journeyed to this monastery of sorts. Uh, it's kind of like a Benedictine order of sorts. And there are four monks, and these monks actually have this secret prison where they have, I think, like 14 women that they torture and rape and basically have for their libertine pleasures of whatever they would like. And it's really interesting looking at this section and seeing kind of on an exegetical level some of the stuff that Sad is trying to do. Because it is really easy to read Saad as just moralizing or almost doing the opposite of moralizing. It's almost a contra-moralizing, just opening of all the floodgates of, oh, let's just do whatever we want and endorsing every one of those actions. But it's important to note, for example, that at the very beginning of this work, Saad claims that this is a letter of sorts to Constance, his lover, and that he's dedicating this work to her, and that the aims of this fiction are such that it is going to represent vice as triumphant and virtue a victim of its attacks. And it says, will a tear from your eyes confirm my victory? In short, having read Justine, will you say, oh, how these portraits of crime make me proud to love virtue, how sublime she is when she weeps, how beautiful she is in misfortune. Oh, Constance, these words need only escape your lips and my labors are rewarded. And if you had not read that, or if you haven't read some of Saad's other work where he approaches some of the critiques that have been levied against him, you would think that he's just, you know, he's putting all of his thoughts in the mouths of these characters who oppose Justine or Therese or these characters that embody virtue. And that by doing this, he's basically, you know, upholding this maximum libertinage. And of course, Saad himself was in prison, including the Bastille. He left like seven days before it was stormed, which is quite crazy. But yes, Saad was a libertine, but also... He was trying to actually tell us something about the way humans actually live. He was confronting some of the idealist tendencies of propping up virtue as something which always gets rewarded. And, you know, he lambasts this notion of an afterlife because it tries to provide comfort where there is none. And in so doing, Saad is very interesting because he plays with comedy and irony and satire in ways that are very difficult to parse out because oftentimes it is very clear that in these characters who oppose Therese, for example, Ironheart, often speaks words that are clearly indicative of Saad's own position. But sometimes they're turned into a sort of ironic, comedic caricature of people that might exist in the real world or of confronting us 
with these secret parts of our minds that we aren't willing to look at. And as such, sad is going to take us to some extremes. For example, one of the monks, Clément, is basically torturing Thérèse. And sad writes here on page 132, in the mouth of Thérèse, the pain caused me to shed tears that fell upon the traces of this monster's rage, rendering them, according to him, a thousand times more attractive. He kissed them, he devoured them, returning again and again to my mouth and my eyes swimming in tears, which he sucked lubriciously. And there's a really interesting link here that is being made in Sad's work. And it's going against the traditional notion of pleasure as an innocent phenomenon. Sad is trying to point out that in fact, oftentimes, we gain pleasure from pain. And in fact, this is a much more important philosophical concern than it may seem, considering this in light of, for example, 21st and 20, really 20th century fascism. And this is a concern for Gilles Deleuze and Félix Guattari, for example, and they point out in anti oedipus that part of the concern of their project of schizoanalysis, basically it's a you know, a revolution of psychoanalysis that's aimed more at getting rid of like the Oedipus complex and the phallus and stuff like this and trying to figure out how do people actually interact with their world and how does desire grow to desire its own repression? How is it that we can desire the own pain of our self-interest? And in so doing, how can this serve our self-interests by watching our own self-interest be lambasted in this rather strange spectacle that is like German, specifically Nazi fascism, for example. So in these cases, Saad is going to kind of create this unity of ecstasy and apathy and debauchery all in one. And we have this very visceral image, right, of tears being sucked lubriciously, which just the word lubriciously, you know, it almost has a connotation or a etymological link to lubrication, right? And this is just creating a very, um, you know, a very ecstatic, almost to the point of satire image of the link between pleasure and pain, the unity of pleasure and pain in these extreme circumstances. So sad actually writing these down, it's not just to satisfy himself and his own pleasures. In fact, it is to really poke a hole in the notion of the objectivity of pleasure as such and find ways in which pleasure actually works. And I find this section around like pages 130 to 140 in this Oxford version of um, Justine to be really pertinent for addressing, well, why is it that he portrays such evil notions of pleasure? How is it that these characters can gain pleasure from the most gratuitous acts of debauchery and evil possible? And Clément has basically been torturing Thérèse in every possible way imaginable. I mean, it just, it goes beyond what I can really describe to you without just reading it word for word and going to the most weird extremes possible, like farting in people's mouths and gaining sexual pleasure from that and just all this really strange stuff. But keeping that in mind, that reaction that I'm manifesting, Clément says, you don't understand the violent commotion that results from the electric fluid produced by the pain of the object that serves our passions. How aroused we are by its suffering. The desire to increase it, that is where these fantasies may come to grief, I know. But is such a danger to be feared by those who laugh at everything? And he's in this really lively mood. They're basically, I think they're in the bed at this point after all this torture has happened. And Clément is basically explaining, 
this really weird tolerance almost within Saad's writings. And it's important to note that in the mouth of Clément, Saad is going to portray this notion of subjects completely detached from their world, completely apathetic to the pleasures of anything but themselves. Basically that, for example, in the case of sex, that it is a notion between a subject and an object. And the further the object is reduced, the higher the subject is raised. And this is not, in, at least not necessarily, Saad endorsing that or creating this as an axiom. No, he is caricaturing a position by bringing it to light in this literary form, by giving it a voice, this caricature can be showed to be extreme and we can react to that extremity as we need. So I quote here this little argument in which he's basically going to say that resistance is futile. And this is really the absolute limit in this work on its own and not to mention his other works, the very limits of liberty, of libertarianism, of the notion that individual autonomy and rights are primary and everything else is secondary because freedom is what is most important. Clément says, the most ridiculous thing in the world, my dear Thérèse, Clément said to me, is doubtless to want to argue about people's tastes, to challenge them, to blame them for them, or to punish them if they are not in conformity either with the laws of the country in which one lives or with social conventions. Indeed, men will never understand that there are no tastes, however bizarre, however criminal, they may be supposed to be, that they do not derive the kind of makeup we have been given by nature. That said, I ask you by what right one man dare demand that another man should reform his tastes or model them on the social order? By what right, even, should laws that are made for man's happiness alone dare to deal severely with him who cannot change his ways or could do so only at the expense of that very happiness that the laws are designed to preserve on his behalf? In any case, even if an individual wished to change his taste, can he do so? Is it in our nature to remake ourselves? Can we become different from what we are? Would you demand it of a deformed man? And is this lack of conformity in our tastes different on a moral level from the imperfection of the deformed man on a physical level? So a lot of very important questions being made here. And I'm harkened back to discussions of, for example, homosexuality in a religious context. And, you know, the religious person will say, well, homosexuality is a sin. You can't act on it. There's nothing wrong with having these thoughts. And then the homosexual will rebut, well, I didn't choose to be gay. In fact, God made me as such. So the notion that this is wrong seems strange considering that I have been engineered in such a way. It seems that I have been created sick and commanded to be well, as Christopher Hitchens says. And Saad is basically using that same argument, but in a secular nature. He's talking of nature instead of God as bestowing us with our thoughts and our inclinations and our feelings. And Saad is saying, on what grounds can we elevate one pleasure or one moral feeling above another? By what right can we differentiate and create a, create a society in which someone has to give up some feeling of personal pleasure when the laws are meant to allow for personal liberty. It seems that by restricting that liberty, of course, and this is a whole question in libertarian ethics in general, is how can you justify detracting from someone's liberty when that liberty is the very essence of what keeps the ethical system coherent. And as such, he says that we're basically born varied 
and free with no real basis for moral imperatives, at least from this very libertarian point of view, especially when we consider, and this is a weird thing that he's saying, can we become different from what we are? And this is a very tricky notion in which I think Sad is sometimes still beholden to kind of Christian notions of this, you know, this inherent, I think it's called aql in Islam, this kind of fundamental soul that makes you what you are, and that somehow this is impervious to change. I don't really see how we can support this on an atheistic level or on a materialist level, or really even on, I mean, like a Deleuzean level. I, I don't really think we can justify this notion of this unified self. And Deleuze, for example, in Difference and Repetition, goes against this very notion, showing how these idealist narratives of you know, this distinction between the real and the not real, or the image and the copy, or the original and the copy, or whatever, are founded on the unity of a primeval subject that somehow is able to resist all these changes. But it seems that, especially considering the kind of changes that Sad wants to take his characters through, it seems a little strange that we can support this notion that we cannot be otherwise than we are. But we can take this in a little bit less of a strict sense and we can say, okay, we have certain inclinations that make us what we are. And by what right should we be forced to change those inclinations if we could use the same argument to tell someone who is physically deformed that they need to somehow unform themselves? So Saad looks at the constancy of the physical nature of us in terms of, you know, if I have five fingers, by what right can someone tell me I must have four? when in fact I have five fingers. It seems like we're appealing to some sort of ideal in order to uphold some standards than others. And especially considering that Sada is a materialist and he's trying to get out of these um, very ideal, very Christian notions of you know the immaterial soul, for example, then the inclinations are a physical matter and they are formed and developed and maintain some sort of constancy, which makes it very difficult to oppose them. Now, considering these initial remarks that Sad has made regarding the impenetrability of you know, these, these pleasurable things, he says, objects only have that value in our eyes, which our imagination creates for them. Given this constant truth, it is therefore quite possible that not only the most bizarre, but even the vilest and most frightful things may affect us very appreciably. So right, people vary, their tastes vary, and people can find pleasure in all sorts of things. Value is a mental construct, at least to an extent. You know, you can talk about the biological value that would make us tend to favor heterosexual relationships, for example, because, you know, there's a biological function of reproduction that would create this tendency towards uh, heterosexual relationships. But nevertheless, that doesn't mean that's the exclusive one, because, of course, there is at least a part of one's personal tastes that are not reduced to biological necessity. They are rather a matter of happenstance, right? And he continues... Such is the human imagination, Thérèse. The same object is represented by it in as many different ways as it has different attitudes. And according to the image of the object received by this imagination, whatever it may be, it will decide to love or hate it. If the imagination is struck by the perceived object in an agreeable way, it will like and prefer it, even though this object may intrinsically have nothing really attractive about it. And even though this object may have a particular value in the eyes of another, if it strikes an individual's imagination in a disagreeable manner, if it strikes an individual, 
the latter will keep his distance from it because none of our feelings is formed or manifested except as a result of the impact of different objects on our imagination. It should be no surprise, then, that what is very pleasing to some can be displeasing to others, and conversely, that the most extraordinary, extraordinary thing can still find followers. The deformed man can also find mirrors that make him handsome. And that mirror reference um, in the paragraph before, he's basically talking about how you can have uh, convex or concave mirrors that can make the same object appear you know, really tiny or really big, and it's still the same object. So in the same way, the imagination can, of course, take various sexual objects, for example, and make them objects of admiration or dismay. And Sad saying, what's wrong with this? What is wrong with someone, for example, finding pleasure in their own pain or in another's pain, considering that objects can assail our senses in various ways, and as a result, they arise or give rise to different affects? And this really concocts a solution which for Sad is to disobey social conventions. It is to not care if someone else finds something pleasurable or not, but rather, if it is pleasurable, then it is pleasurable, regardless of the societal sentiments regarding this thing. It's a question of free unfettered sentiments and emotions that are free from social conventions. Speaking here on page 136, Clément continues, there is no reason to find a preference at table any less extraordinary than a preference in bed. And in either case, it is no more surprising to worship a thing that the majority of men find detestable than it is to love another thing that is generally acknowledged to be good. To like what others like demonstrates conformity in the organs, but nothing in favor of the beloved object. Three quarters of the world can find the smell of a rose delicious without this being a reason either to condemn that quarter who may find it smells bad or to show that this smell is truly agreeable. So Said is saying that the notion of agreeableness of an object to our sensations is entirely a question of framing, of even if everyone else likes something and I therefore decide to like it, that doesn't tell me any, anything about the genuine likability of that object, but rather my ability to conform to the societal sentiments. And basically this is going to lead to a rather helpful guideline in life in general, which is to experiment to not, you know, harp on something until you've actually tried it and you can say, okay, well, I didn't find it pleasurable, even though you know, everyone else says it's pleasurable, or I did find it pleasurable, even though everyone else says that it's not only not pleasurable, but not natural, for example, in the, in the case of uh, homosexuality. Now, Sad almost comes across as nihilistic in the way he portrays the fixity of nature and the tendencies of the self which result from nature which has imbued us with them. And I think it rests on a false assumption, and it's an important element of Sad's philosophy in general. Now, Sad has told us thus far, and I spoke of it in my other lecture, that nature is basically indifferent to our moral feelings. All the time it is going to reward chaos or debauchery everywhere in nature, regardless of what we think about it. And this is a marked shift from the moralizing of, for example, Christianity. Now, the problem is, Sad's atheism in particular still holds on to some vestiges of Christianity, namely nature with a capital N. And nature with this capital N, this kind of, this totality of nature, which has some defined essence, a sort of will of sorts. Now, of course, it's not a conscious will. It's just, you know, nature wills for a mountain to fall or for a volcano to erupt and whatnot. But this notion of nature with the capital N 
Well, it can be personified throughout this narrative, and it provides some really interesting ways of looking at, well, what is the, nature can almost be like the world, irrespective of our feelings about it. It's a sort of realism, right? The problem with this is that nature is presumed to be, at the fundamental level, fixed, immovable, constant, and unchanging. And this notion of the unchanging one is a remnant that I'm not sure how sad is actually justifying it. On page 137, Clément continues, it is then that our tastes are fixed and nothing in the world can henceforth destroy them. No matter how a child is brought up, nothing changes them and the person who is destined to be a criminal will just as surely become so, however well he is educated as the person whose organs dispose him to virtue will follow the path of righteousness, even if his teacher has failed him. Both have acted in accordance with their makeup, with the impressions that they have received from nature, and one is no more deserving of punishment than the other is deserving of reward. Now that latter part, I think, is a little bit more interesting to look at. The notion of reward and punishment is a rather arbitrary human construct, but this notion of the makeup we have received from nature as being essentially fixed seems very difficult to justify considering that Usad has mentioned just before this quote that I mentioned how we are imbued at the time of our conception with information and with these fundamental dispositions which grow and develop throughout our lives it seems that in light of this, and in light of the fact that we will interact with our environment in different ways, that in fact our sentiments and our makeup, our impressions, our fundamental impressions, will change. And it's very interesting to see how in some ways Sad is prefiguring Freudian psychoanalysis, because Freud is talking about these fundamental pathologies which make up how we are going to act in the world. Of course, you know, one of these being the Oedipus complex. Now, it seems difficult to appeal to this sort of fundamental fixity of the self or of the impressions from nature without appealing to some sort of ideal, immovable, unchanging notion of like the one, of this sort of divine will which coats over material reality. So given that, it seems difficult to say that our tastes are fixed. Now, it is interesting to note that there is some constancy to our tastes. For example, being gay. There is constancy to that. It is a taste just like being straight is a taste. And it is not something you can just pray away or something you can just snap away. No, it has constancy. And I think in that sense, we can say, yes, there is some fixity to us that we needn't try to ground in some sort of ideal state of, oh, you must pray the gay away, so to speak. I don't think we can do that. So in that sense, sad is very helpful here. Now, these musings are basically going to culminate in an extreme form of tolerance, which has the potential to be interesting, but potentially counterproductive. And that's why I think it's important to realize that SAD is not necessarily giving us a moral imperative to tolerate all, but rather he is taking a look at those who are intolerant and questioning where they derive their justification from. On what grounds can they suppose something is higher than something else, or more worthy of praise than something else, or more virtuous than something else, considering the divergence of human tastes? Clément continues, in short, must the temple of reproduction attract us any more strongly, awaken our desires, any more surely than that part of the body that is most contrary to it or most distant from it? 
or than those more repulsive or disgusting things which emanate from such a body? And I think that's a little bit of a slight to their famous coprophagy, which is the practice of eating another's feces, which figures prominently in Sad's writings, that well, why can't we find pleasure in something which seems the most lowly, considering that, you know, everything is equal under nature. He continues, it should not be any more surprising, it seems to me, to find that a man has singular tastes in the pleasures of libertinism than to find that he has such an approach to other aspects of life. Once again, in both cases, his singularity is the product of his organs. Is it his fault? If what interests you has no meaning for him, or if he is excited only by what you find repugnant, right? If someone is gay, it's not their fault that they're gay. On what grounds can you tell them not to be gay? On what grounds can you reform their behavior without reference to some absurd ideal of sexuality? Saad is taking that same argument and leading us to at least question intolerance and in that regard make way for the possibility of tolerance of things which go against social norms, culminating in what we see here on the bottom of page 137. Those who wish to deal severely with such a man are motivated by the most stupid, the most barbaric intolerance. Whatever his deviations might be, society should find him no more guilty than the person who, as I have just said, came into the world half-blind or lame. And it is just as unjust to punish or to mock the one as it would be to afflict or to ridicule the other. The man endowed with singular tastes is ill, or if you like, he is a woman suffering from hysterical vapors. Has it ever occurred to us to punish or to torment either of these? Let us be equally fair towards the man whose whims surprise us. And this is a really weird spot that you'll get to in Sad's philosophy, where you get an actually quite helpful ethical maxim or axiom of how I ought to interact with people. Let us be equally fair towards the man whose whims surprise us. This is a very useful piece of advice. And I think it's very interesting to see how does Sad's work as a whole culminate in that? How does our witnessing of the most defamed debauchery imaginable bring us closer to understanding how we have come to the tastes we have and how is it that we can find a more realistic, more pragmatic view of the way virtue is treated and the way vice is upheld specifically, and use that to reflect on our tolerance for others? And one may question that, oh, this wasn't Sad's point, that he's not asking us to be tolerant because tolerance is good, he's just asking us to be tolerant so that he can get away with whatever he wants. I think we could continue to use the argumentation of, so what? Why not let people do what they want? And this has a limit. At least pragmatically speaking, we can't just let people, you know, murder whenever they want, because of course that just leads to a sort of chaos, but a chaos that Sad is willing to poke at. If we saw in the last lecture, he's asking us to poke at that state of nature Hobbes says we have escaped from, and question, is that state of nature really so bad when it culminates in this absolute liberty of the individual to entertain his or her tastes and comforts? So I hope this has been helpful in understanding the philosophy of Marquis de Sade. I'll hopefully probably be doing maybe one more lecture on this work because it's very exciting, very interesting. I would much encourage you to read Justine by the Marquis de Sade, The 120 Days of Sodom. I also hear is quite good. I'll hopefully be reading that someday. Um, you should hopefully be seeing some stuff potentially on the Invisible Committee and some stuff on Palestine coming up soon. 
check out any of my other lectures I've done on postmodernism, German idealism, gender theory, other literature. Leave any constructive or non-constructive criticism in the comments below. Become a channel member if you'd like, and I do a monthly private philosophy Zoom. That's it, and I'll see you in another lecture.